Have you ever ran a marathon or have you ever trained for one? You see, I trained for one that I never actually ended up running. That's my level of commitment. But, um, and some of you are probably thinking, why would I ever do that to my body? 26.2 miles sounds like the dumbest idea ever. But I did. I trained for one that I never actually ended up running. And I trained by running through the streets in my neighborhood. And every other week or so, I'd add distance. I didn't really have a strategy. I'm not a very strategic guy, but I just add distance that felt like I needed to push myself. And at one point, I was running past this house. And the first time I went past this house, um, there was a vicious beast in the front yard. Okay. When I first came upon the house, I heard it rustling behind a bush and kind of snarling and growling at me. And then all of a sudden it jumps out from behind the bush, teeth bearing, drool dripping down its face. It wants to kill me. Some of you guys know these creatures as dogs. All right. <laughs> and this guy wanted me dead. And he's lurching at me. The only thing that stands between me and death is the leash that he's wearing. And you should know two things about me. Number one, I don't sport, which means if this guy gets off the leash and I cannot outrun him whatsoever, like I'm terrible at running, hence the not actually running the marathon. Second thing you should know is I also don't animal, okay? So if this guy gets off the leash, I have no tools in my toolkit on how to subdue him, right? Some of you guys can just go fluff the ears and go, oh, that's a good doggy. I don't have that kind of charisma with animals, okay? And so if he gets off his leash, I'm dead meat. Well, sure enough, one day I'm on my run. I have, I have the music up majorly loud because I know this dog is going to try and freak me out. It's, it always kind of pierces anxiety and tension in my heart when I pass this house. So I have my, my music cranked and I'm a couple miles in. I pass this house and I hear the dog even over my music, but something's wrong. He's getting closer and closer and closer. He has no leash right? And he's coming towards me, running down the driveway, bounding towards me, jowls bouncing about, his, his teeth bearing, drool flying everywhere. And I just freaked out, like terror struck, struck into my heart. And I straight up force gumped it out of there. Like I just booked it up the hill. This dog came in, chasing me up the hill, nipping at my ankles and the back of my legs. He never actually bit me. To him, it was a totally fun game. I was mortified. And once we got to the top of the hill, he went back home. He had had his fun. But I was terrified in the moment. And needless to say, I got the best time on my run that I had ever gotten before. I've never beat it. But I was focused on finishing this last mile. I was focused on the race ahead of me. And an obstacle came in my path. And I diverted my attention to it. And it totally controlled me. He had total control of me up that hill. Today, we're going to continue our series called Run the Race. And last week, Pastor Paul began with a message about how, from Hebrews 12, how about how we should fix our eyes on Jesus, the founder and finisher of our faith. Today, we're going to talk about something that often causes us to avert our eyes from Jesus, much like I did with that dog. It's hardship. We're going to look at this idea that God disciplines us through hardship, but we need to do a little bit of work before we get there. You see, last week, Pastor Paul, he kind of defined endurance this way, fixing your eyes on Jesus despite the difficulties of your race. When hardship comes, stay focused on Jesus. And the passage we're about to read says that God's discipline often can come through hardship and affliction. And there's a little bit of work that we need to do with this word discipline because you and I, we come into this idea of discipline with all sorts of presuppositions, right? I, I discipline my kids as a parent means that I give them a spanking or, or uh, if, they, if they've done something wrong, I give them a timeout, right? If you steal at a store, your punishment is to go to jail. If you do drugs, your punishment is to go to prison. And so we, our whole world kind of operates around this idea of punishment as a result of your actions. And that is not what this passage is talking about. The word in this passage, the Greek word for discipline, which occurs, I think, something like 12 times in these few verses we're about to read. It's pay duo. Pay duo. And it's literally a word that was used to describe the training that an athlete would do to prepare for their sport. Uh, a good definition from it or for it is to be instructed, taught, or to train. 
When we see discipline in this passage, I want you to remember, this is not punishment from God. It's training from God. God uses hardship and affliction to train us, not to punish us. Okay? So we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 4. And I want to do a little bit of background just again about the book of Hebrews. It was written to Jewish Christians who understood what it meant to go through hardship. They had been immensely persecuted against. In fact, most commentators say that they probably had experienced um, what it meant to be under Nero's ruling Rome. Nero was a, a ruler of Rome that viciously persecuted the church. So much so that he would use Christians, uh, extra biblical uh, sources will tell us that he would use Christians to light up his gardens. He would set them on fire as human torches. So these people understand what it means to suffer. And it seems at this, mo at this moment that they're asking, God, if we're your children, why? Why is this happening to us? And it's to that very question that the author of Hebrews speaks in this passage today. So we're going to start in verse uh, four. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. So he hearkens back to a, an image of Jesus in the garden where he's wrestling with following what God had called him to. He's struggling through the discipline, the training of God. And he's there and he's asked his friends to pray for him. He says he's sorrowful to the point of death. And this is where Jesus makes the decision to continue the mission to the cross. And so he reminds them, don't forget how you can endure this. Don't forget Jesus's example. You've not yet been to the point that he went to remember him. That's how you can persevere in this trial. And it goes on, it says, and have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his sons? I love this. He says, have you completely forgotten? Like the, the trial that you're walking through can be so loud. The pain can just drown out the truth. And he says, have you forgotten? God addresses you as his children. And here's what he says. My son, don't make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Chastening literally means to train through affliction. Again, when we're talking about discipline, we're not talking about punishment. So he's talking about when we go through affliction or when we go through trials, to not take them lightly, to not despise them, to not reject them because God is treating you as his children, as a loving heavenly father wants to raise us up in the way that we should go. It's almost as if hardship is this cosmic chisel that is forming you into the person that God wants you to become. And he continues, endure hardship as discipline God is treating you as his children for what children are not disciplined by their father. I just want to pause here for a moment. I realize that some of us in the room are reeling right now because we're going through hardship. You're in the midst of the pain, in the midst of the trial. You're walking through affliction right now. You're suffering and it's painful. And I want to pause because I do not want to belittle your pain. I, I don't want to just give you some trite cliches and some sermon points to slap a bandaid on your pain. What my hope is and my heart is today, and I hope you can hear this, is that I would bring truth into your hardship with you because it can be life giving, even in the most dis difficult places. So he says, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate at all. Not true sons and daughters at all. So he, he has this weird little phrase there. He says, if you're not disciplined, but everybody undergoes discipline. And I think what he's saying is, look, God, if you are a son of, uh, of God or a daughter of God, God is training you. 
And you can go through God's boot camp of suffering and affliction and trials and learn nothing from it. He's saying, don't let your suffering be wasted. Don't, don't let it pr- provide nothing for you. God wants to produce something in you through it. And he said, you can go through training and not be trained by it. Every legitimate son and daughter of God goes through the boot camp of suffering. Jesus did. He says, moreover, we've all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of spirits and live? They disciplined us, they being our our humanly fathers, disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good in order that we might share in his holiness. You see, he's contrasting human and heavenly fathers. He says, look, your parents did the best they could. Some of us, maybe the parents weren't there. Maybe you were abandoned. Maybe you had poor examples. But he's, he, he's not so much speaking to the example of your parents as he is the example of a heavenly father. There's a difference between what we experienced with our parents, with our, heaven, or with our earthly fathers, and what we experienced with our heavenly father. Our earthly fathers did it as the best they could, as best as they thought. And sometimes that was very selfish. But God disciplines us for our good. He trains us for our good. And the end result, it says, look here, to share in his holiness. He wants to produce holiness in us through it. God's discipline, God's training is always for our good, even when it doesn't feel good. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. I love the honesty of the Bible. This is not flowery language. He says, this is going to hurt. Like training hurts. When you're training for a marathon, your muscles get sore. When you're training to go on a backcountry excursion, you get exhausted from the, the pre- preparation for it. And when you're training spiritually in the midst of trials, in the midst of suffering, in the midst of adversity, it hurts a different kind of hurt. It's not physical. It's emotional. It's spiritual. And he acknowledges this is going to hurt. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. I love that. There's something that comes after the pain. There's a couple things that I want us to really hone in on in this passage and I, I, I want to be up front. Um, as I prepared for this message, I realized I don't fully understand this topic. God's discipline is so vast. And, and I, as I studied and I studied this passage and I, I got insight from other pastors and other staff members and other brothers and sisters in Christ, I don't fully understand this. But I think there's a few things that we can take away from this passage that I really want to hone in on. One of them is what is God's intention in allowing suffering to train us? And then once we've seen that, then what should our response be? What's an appropriate response to the suffering that we experience? The first thing I want you to see in this passage is God's discipline is confirmation, not condemnation. God's discipline is confirmation of sonship, not condemnation of a sinner. Remember, we talked about this already. Discipline is not punishment. Jesus, he's hanging on the cross and he says, it is finished. The word there is tetelestai. It is a word that connotes a legal financial transaction that the debt is paid in full. The penalty for our sin is done away with. Jesus took it upon himself. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. When God looks at you, he does not just see, he does not see your sin. He sees his righteousness because of what Christ did for you on the cross. When we experience trials, it is not condemnation. It's not punishment. It's not God up there saying, well, they messed up yesterday. So I got to make sure they really get it today. It's God lovingly bringing correction through difficulty into our lives. 
It's God lovingly producing good things in us through the suffering and, and afflictions that we may experience in this life. Let's look at it in the passage. It says, have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? Look at this relational language. A father, a son. And he goes on, says, my son, don't make light of the Lord's discipline and don't lose heart when he rebukes you. Why? Because the Lord disciplines the one he loves. What if in the midst of the trial, instead of us, us having this, this, I often have this feeling like, God, do you even care? What if I could have the mentality that in the midst of the trial, this is evidence of God's love because he's disciplining me through this. And he chastens everyone he accepts as a son. Remember, chastening is training through affliction. This is confirmation of our adoption. This is evidence of sonship. Earlier in the passage, it said, what child is not trained by their father? God lovingly trains us and he often does it in trials and adversity. This is a picture of me when I was uh, 18 years old. Uh, I told you I'm an emo kid, okay? This is the evidence, all right? I've always had a lot of hair. I'm just kind of displaced where it was on my head. But uh, this is me. I thought I was looking good that day, by the way. But this is me uh, shortly after an arrest. This is March 13th, 2006. I had just turned 18 years old. And um, I was driving home from a drug deal at three o'clock in the morning. And a police officer pulled me over seven blocks from my home. And he got me out. He arrested me. They found the drugs in my car. They put me in the back of the police car. And he said, look, I'll do you a solid. If you'll give me your mom's phone number, since we're so close to your home, I'll just have her come pick up your vehicle. It won't get impounded. And I'm like, okay, I might actually just want it to get impounded. I don't know if I want mom to know what's going on here. But I gave him the number and mom and dad showed up. And you, you know you're in trouble then. And they came to the back of the car. And I felt so ashamed. I'm a criminal. I'm a drug addict. I'm a junkie. They're, the neighbors are starting to peek through the windows, even though it was with the wee hours of the morning. And my mom looked at me and I hung on every word she said as she told me, you're my son and I love you. And I hope you learn something through this. You're my son and I love you. She began with relationships. She said, I love you despite what you're going through. She didn't see me as a criminal. She didn't identify me with my sin. She said, you're my son and I love you, but I'm not bailing you out of this. You see, you're going to need to go through hardship uh, so that you can learn something, so you can grow through this. She loved me enough to allow hardship into my life that I might change. And while the hardship was at the hands of my own stupidity, God does something similar where he allows hardship, not because of our actions, not, not because our sin and now I've got to get back at them, but he allows hardship in our life for the same reasons my mom did. Because she loved me, he loves me. And he desires to produce something in us through it. But we have to turn to him in the midst of it. Several weeks ago, I was leaving a, a meeting at work and I was so angry, just so mad. Uh, and I was anxious. I felt this tension in my heart and I was just, the, the, the head was spinning. And I got home and I thought, I'm going to deal with this frustration. I put on my running shoes. I got my loud, angry screamo music and I went running for several miles I thought, this is going to do it. And as I'm running, I'm like, yeah, I should be mad. I, I came back to my house more angry than when I left. And so I come into my house and that didn't suffice. So I go to the kitchen, grab a pound of chocolate and just nom, 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 right? I'm, I'm feeding my emotions. I'm, I'm trying to just eat them. Well, that didn't work. My wife is about to leave for work. She's got about 10 minutes before she has to leave to go to Starbucks and because the chocolate didn't suffice and the running didn't suffice and the music didn't suffice, I lightning rotted with her and I told her all how I'm mad and I'm mad at this and I can't believe this and, and now she's mad. And then I, this whole session culminated with me going into my bedroom, picking up my phone, going on the internet and purchasing $100 in camping gear I don't even need. 
You know what I was doing? God had allowed hardship. He had allowed adversity. He had allowed a trial. I wasn't looking to him. I turned to idols. You see, I turned to the idol of running. Running is not bad, but if it becomes what you turn to instead of Jesus is an idol. I turned to chocolate. I turned to music. I turned to my wife. I turned to money. And it was only after I bought that $100 in gear that I didn't even need that I realized what I was doing. I needed to turn to Jesus. So let me ask you, when you're walking through the trial, where do you turn? You see what I was doing? As I was seeking from creation what only the creator can give me. I wanted peace. And I sought it from all these other places and I can't get it anywhere but from Jesus. He gives peace that surpasses understanding. That means even when it doesn't make sense to have peace, we can have peace. Where do you turn in the midst of your trial? The next thing I want you to see is that God's discipline is painful and purposeful. It's painful and purposeful. Let's look at it in the passage. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Look, when you're walking through the difficulty, it hurts. It's painful and purposeful. Several years ago, uh, my daughter, Audra, This is a picture of her. She's beautiful. Uh, She was two years old and she was really interested in the holes in her head at the time for some reason, like just pray for me and my parenting. I don't get my kids, but she, she was really interested in the holes in her head, her ears, her nose, her mouth. Okay. And we had to teach her ears are for listening. Nose is for smelling. Mouth is for eating. Okay. Well, she kind of mixed those up. And so one day we're sitting in the living room and she had, we had some trail mix and I kept telling her, don't put the raisins, don't put the nuts in your mouth, in your, in your ears or in your nose. Well, when we are not looking, she shoves two whole cashews up her n- single one nostril and doesn't tell us. Like she's having a great time. I don't know how that's fun for her, but it was. Until the next day when she's experiencing some pain. And she comes to Shaughnessy and she says, mommy, my nose hurts. And she started to get this little green drip right here. And so we had her look up and sure enough, you can see the two cashews right up her nose. And so we sat her down on the couch and we said, Audra, look, you, you, know, you, you made a mistake and we, we forgive you, but we want to help you. you. We can't leave those up there and it won't go well for you if we do. You're going to grow a tree out of your nose. So um, Shaughnessy showed her the tool that she was going to use, just you know, some small metal tweezers. And you and I know tweezers are just a helpful tool to get those cashews out of her nose. But to Audra, it might as well have been a murder weapon because now she is writhing on the couch, freaking out, flailing her arms and head about. Her face is turning beet red. She's crying. I'm now crying because I'm too emotional to handle this, right? And Shaughnessy's like, hey, we got to hold her down. What? We got to hold her down? Yeah, we got to get these things out. So Shaughnessy, my wife, she sits on top of our two-year-old girl, holding her arms down and I'm holding her head bawling as she's bawling and screaming. I'm pretty sure the neighbors thought we were just trying to kill each other, but, and we got those cashews out and we were talking to Audra about, about this a couple of weeks ago. She still remembers it. She said, you know, it was so scary. Mommy and daddy, who I love and trust, let me go through something that was really hard and painful. You guys held me down. You wouldn't let me get up. It was against what I wanted. It was against her will. It was scary and it was painful, but it was for her good. You see, God's discipline is painful. It doesn't feel good, especially when you're walking through affliction, but it's for our good. No discipline seems pain, pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Listen to me, in the midst of the pain, you're not going to see the purpose. And the truth is, you may never see the purpose this side of eternity. 
What you're called to in the midst of the pain is not to try and figure out why is this happening? I understand that question. It's not a bad question to ask, but I believe what God is calling us to in the midst of our affliction and our suffering is to have faith that our present suffering can produce future fruit. That's what he says right here. Look, a harvest of righteousness and peace. And you're not going to know how that's going to come about. There's a guy in the Bible, his name's Joseph. And you want to talk about somebody who went through through some affliction. (laughs) This dude was trial by fire, okay? He was born into a family, had lots of brothers. They all hated him, hardship. Hated him so much that they nearly tried to kill him, hardship. Then they realized, you know what? We could really make some money off this guy. And they sold him as a slave, hardship. When he goes to his new kingdom, he raises through the ranks and becomes second in all the kingdom. And then the king's wife falsely accuses him of trying to commit adultery with her. Hardship. He's falsely imprisoned. Hardship. When he's in prison, he helps somebody interpret a dream and they get out of jail and he said, don't forget about me. They forgot about him and he wastes away in jail. Hardship. Joseph experienced hardship after hardship. And I wonder, it doesn't say in scripture, but I wonder, did he ever just, why God? Why? Why? Well, at the end of his story, there's this awesome moment where he gets together with his brothers and there's this forgiveness and reconciliation. Everybody comes back together. And here's what he says. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. God used your evil. He used your hardship. He used the pain that you brought into my life, all the suffering that I experienced for good. Our God is so powerful that he can use even the worst things for our good. That's what he was saying. And you know what happened as a result? The kingdom went through a famine unfazed because of the leadership and spiritual lessons that Joseph learned throughout the hardship. You see, but Joseph got an answer to why he experienced his hardship. That's not always going to be true. And that's where in the midst of hardship, all you're called to do is have faith that your present suffering can produce future fruit. But there's this, there's this interesting little phrase at the end of this verse. He says, it produces harvest of righteousness and peace, but only for those who have been trained by it. For those who have been trained by it, our response matters. And so there's in this passage, I don't know if you noticed it yet, but there's three responses and I want to hone in on those. Two of them were warned against and one of them were encouraged towards. Let's look at it here. He says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. The first response we can have is we're called to don't take it lightly. Don't take it lightly. So we're not supposed to take it lightly. The opposite of that is we're supposed to take it seriously. And in the midst of hardship, instead of say, saying, I don't want this God or, or taking it flippantly, or I just want to get through this. Just get me through this, Jesus. Let's just get this over with. I don't know about you, but that's exactly how I felt about COVID. Right? I, I just like, God, let's just get this over with. I'm so tired of the fighting and the problems and I'm tired of a mask. I'm tired of everything. I'm tired of the relational tensions. I'm tired, Jesus. Let's just get this over with. And that was my response throughout the last year. I took it lightly. God brought affliction. He brought difficulty. He allowed difficulty into our lives. And my response was, God, Jesus, just, just please just get this over with. We're not to take lightly God's discipline, God's training. The next thing that he warns against is he says, my son, don't make light of the Lord's discipline and don't lose heart when he rebukes you. Don't lose heart. Don't just give up. You know, when you see that God's trying to produce something in you, when you know he wants to make a change and, and you think, well, I just can't do it. Honestly, this is my default response because I'm not looking at Jesus's power to change me. I'm looking at myself and seeing where God is taking me and saying, I can't get there. 
Let me ask you, which of these two do you fall under more? Are you more where you take it lightly, where you just, God, just get, just get this over with. Fix it, Jesus. Or are you the one that just gives up? You see, I think the Hebrews were facing both of those. Jesus, just get rid of the persecution. Or this is just my life now. I guess I'm just going to live this way forever. Neither of these are honoring God in the midst of discipline. Both of them, in fact, are rejecting God's discipline, God's training. When I was uh, two years old, uh, or two to four years old, uh, I loved being a cowboy. I had a cowboy hat and I had a little cowboy cap gun and I'd run around the house in my diaper with my cap gun and my cowboy hat. I wanted to be a rebel so bad. And my mom always told me, you know, don't stick your head through the bars of the staircase. We had two steps up into the kitchen. It had a metal railing. And she always told me, don't do that because I always tried to do it. Well, one day I was finally successful at my endeavor. And I sat there, diaper on, my head through the bars. And it's, a, it's God's grace that we don't have a picture of this anymore. Just, Jesus is just loving me because I didn't want to show you guys that. My mom checked. We don't have it anymore. But, but I'm, I'm there stuck behind the bars. And I, I didn't realize this until just now. Oh, it's almost like prophetic from when I went to jail. But, <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm stuck in the bars and my mom turns around and she just busts up laughing and takes my picture but she had trained me. She had said, look, if you do this, it's not going to go well for you. Don't do this. And I rejected her training. I rejected her wisdom. And there I was in some pain because I had rejected her wisdom and I had rejected her training. Both of these are a rejection of what God wants to do in us in the midst of affliction. So we're, we're called to not take it lightly and to not lose heart. But here's what we're called to do. He says, moreover, verse nine, we've had all, we've all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of spirits and live? How much more should we submit? We're called to submission. Submission means literally to come under another's mission, Right? In the midst of the affliction, we're not going to know what God's mission for this specific problem is. Why are you doing this? What are you trying to produce in me? It's not very clear most of the time. But it's having faith that God knows what he's doing and that he is, in fact, good. In the midst of affliction, submission is trusting that God is good even when the world around you is not. And hardship is a gift if you can see it that way. And the way that we open the gift of hardship is through submitting to God. Because he wants to produce something in us that is beautiful and gracious and loving. It will form us into the image of Jesus. So let me ask you, what is your response when you're undergoing trials? I think there's a good indicator. Is the common question you ask, why is this happening to me? And can you flip it and say, Lord, I don't understand. What are you trying to teach me? I'm going to release to the campuses. I love you guys.